Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for our webinar on data parsing in Seascape. Presentation itself is roughly about 16 odd minutes. If you have any questions at any point, you have a, a questions panel in front of you, so you can just input there and we shall go through those at the end. Um, I think we'll get going from there, so. Welcome to today's tutorial. Let's get started. Let's have a look at today's agenda. Today, we're going to be looking at data parsing. We'll look at data parsing instructions such as bitwise, shift left, shift right, and multi-shift. We'll also have programming examples and video demonstrations. As always, we'll finish with a Q&A session. What is data parsing? Let's start with the general definition of the word parse. To parse is to examine or analyze minutely. In the computing world, to parse is to take data from one format and transform it to another format. Today, when we talk about data parsing, we're going to be talking about manipulating a string of data to extract and isolate one piece of data. Why do we need to parse data? Sometimes the data we want is buried in a larger string or bucket of data. To extract that data, it can involve a number of operations, such as getting rid of extra data that is undesired, moving the data that you want around so it can be interpreted properly as an integer value or a floating point value or converting from one data type to another. Let's talk about some of the instructions that you can use in the parsing operations in Seascape. Let's start with the bitwise and function. In Seascape, there are a number of what are called bitwise operations, which deal with data at a bit level. The bitwise and function is great for clearing the data you're not interested in, which is also called masking off. The instruction performs a bit by bit and function on the binary value of two inputs. The first input, typically, is the variable that you're operating on, and the second input is typically a constant that's going to be anded with your variable. The reason you're doing that is because depending on the constant that you select, it's going to effectively mask off different bits within that word or double word that you're operating on. For all the bit locations that you want to keep, you're going to put a one in the binary location for that masked value. For data you want to throw away or clear, you're going to put a zero in those locations in the mask value. Let's look at an example. Let's say that we have a variable R1 that contains eight bits of desired data. As this is a word type variable, typically that contains 16 bits worth of data, not just eight bits. Here, we want the eight bits located in the middle. We can use a bitwise and function to get rid of the data we don't care about. You can see in this representation, the ends in green are the eight bits we care about, and the red X's is the undesired data, which are set to zero. Moving along in our example, we're going to create a data mask where the top four positions and the lower four positions are all zeros. Then in the middle, we're going to put eight consecutive ones, which is the eight consecutive bits that we want. That data mask, which is a binary pattern, converts to a decimal value of 7698. And we take R1 and we end it with that 7698 decimal. Our result is the data from the middle that we wanted. Now the data is probably not where we want it, but at least we got rid of the data we didn't want by setting it to zero. Next, let's look at the shift left and shift right functions. This instruction is used for moving bits into new positions in a word or double word type variable. Shifting left moves the binary data bits up, so bits become higher in significance. Bits that are shifted above the most significant position, the 16th bit effectively, are discarded. The shift right instruction moves the bits down so they become lower in significance, and any bits that are shifted below the least significant position are discarded. Again, you have two inputs. The first input is the variable you're going to be working on. The second input is the number of positions that you want to shift left or right. Let's look at our example. We have register 11 with 8 bits of data that we wanted in the middle of the word and with the unwanted data cleared to zero. Now we need to align those bits we want with the least significant position so it can be interpreted correctly. Let's say that's a decimal value from 0 to 255 and we want it to be interpreted properly as a decimal value. If we leave it there in the middle, it's not going to be interpreted correctly as a decimal value. Using the shift right instruction, the input is R11 and N is 4 because we want to shift right 4 positions. 
Then the end result for our output variable, which we've assigned as R12, is going to be the 8 bits that we want in the proper position. Next, let's look at the multi-shift function. We did a complete video on shift registers, which covers this in more detail, which you can find on the Horner website. But as it relates to data parsing, we're going to have a look at it again. The multi-shift function is good for shifting data around when more than two words of data are involved. Let's look at the input values and output values. Firstly, the source is the start of the first variable in your array of data. Length is how many elements there are in the array. The multi-shift function works with either bits, bytes, words, or double words, so you can select the form that's most convenient for you. Direction is the direction you want to shift. If you want to shift left, you would make that a variable that has a binary value of 1, like always on. If you want to shift right, you would assign a variable with a binary value of 0, like always off for instance. In is the data you want to shift in. If you're dealing with characters, it's convenient to use a variable that has a value of 0 to shift in. That's because you'll be shifting into your array of characters, the null character, ASCII null or ASCII 0 which indicates the end of an ASCII field. Often the specific data you shift in is not important and you're more interested in the data that's already there that you have shifted around to a new position. Out is the data being shifted out. Now let's look at an example. Let's say that we have a multi-shift that we're going to use here to help us deal with a series of 16 consecutive registers that contain a string of 32 characters from a barcode scanner. ASCII characters take one byte per character, and there are two bytes per word. So if you have 32 characters, you need 16 words. In that string of 32 characters, the 12th through the 20th character happens to be the part number field that we are interested in. We want to isolate that field and create a separate variable for the part number. Our source of the data is going to be register 101, because that's the start of our data. As we're dealing with characters, we're going to do a byte type multi-shift. The length, therefore, is 32 bytes, which is equivalent of 16 words. How many positions are we going to shift? We've said that the part number field starts at the 12th character. Why wouldn't we shift 12 positions here? Well, if we shift 0 positions, the first character is in the first position. So if we want the 12th character to be in the first position, we need to shift 11 positions. We'll set our n to shift to 11. Now, which direction do we want to go? We could make it work either way, but typically I move the data I'm interested in down to the first position, so we'll be shifting right. Therefore, I'll assign always off or a binary value of zero to the direction on the input side. Because I'm dealing with characters, I'll shift in zeros at all positions I'm shifting into. For the output, I'll assign a junk variable because I don't care about the output of this instruction. Let's take a continued look at this example. Let's say that this is what our barcode data looks like in ASCII before we do a shift. First we've got SN1011, which is our serial number. Then we have a carriage return character. Then we have a four digit numeric field followed by the start of the part number, which is HE-XC1000. After that we've got a carriage return, a date field, and then a couple more carriage return characters, and then a line feed. The information we're interested in starts with that HEXC1000. So if we shift 11 places now, the part number we're interested in is at the beginning of the data. Again, just like with the AND instruction, we haven't done the entire job here. All we've done is move the data we care about to the first position so it's easier to work with. We're still going to have to do subsequent operations to move the data from this bank over to its own variable. So we'll use instructions such as a byte move instruction, which you can use to move the nine bytes of the part number over to its own variable. Let's begin our first demo. Here we're dealing with numbers, not ASCII characters. This is an example we might see in a JA1939 application, which is a CAN-based protocol supported by the OCS, which is used on any automated device that has a diesel engine. First, we'll talk about JA1939. J1939 uses a bucket of data called a PGN. Each PGN has a number associated with it as well as a description. Let's look at PGN 61444, which is called the Electronic Engine Controller 1 parameter. Within those 8 bytes or 4 words is a series of different parameters which are listed here. 
by its 4 and 5 is engine speed in RPM. What you'll notice where I've highlighted it in red is that the least significant byte for engine speed is located in the upper byte of register 202 and the most significant byte of engine speed is in the lower byte of register 203. So where it resides, it cannot be currently interpreted as a proper 16-bit decimal number. What we need to do is shift the bytes around so that they are next to each other in the same variable. So let's go into Seascape and see how we would program that. I'm not covering here how the data came in from a J1939 standpoint. I'm assuming the data is already here and we're just going to handle that data. Here I'm using the shift right instruction. I'm dealing with a 32-bit value. I've been able to isolate the data I'm interested in into a variable that's 32 bits long. That means the shift left and the shift right instructions can be used. I'm going to shift right 8 positions which moves the data down 8 bit positions or 1 byte. Then I'll take that result and store it in a new variable that I've assigned to register 211. The last thing I'm going to do is just convert it from its decimal value to RPM, which is a simple mathematical operation where I divide by 8. Let's look at what that could look like on our OCS. Here is the numeric parsing screen. At the top, I have four word type data fields that are showing the four words for PGN 61444. Looking at the data as individual words on the OCS, you can see those are the decimal values that we are looking at for those four words. But the data we're interested in, again, is buried in a couple of bytes that are not falling on word boundaries. Then I did my shift. My result was a value of 16,000. Then my engine speed and RPM was calculated by dividing that by 8. Overall, we simply used the shift right instruction looking at the data as a double word, shifted down 8 bits, and then looked at that result as a single word, and then divided that by 8 to convert to RPM. In our second demonstration, we're going to be parsing ASCII data using the example I showed in the previous slides. Here is that example again, where we have a bank of 32 characters stored in 16 registers that consists of a barcode that we've scanned in, and we need to isolate or parse that part number field. Let's look at that in Seascape. First, let's look at this line where we're doing several operations in a row. What we have in this example is a barcode scanner which is dumping the barcode data into register 81 through 96. So there are 16 consecutive registers where this barcode ASCII data is residing. That's the direct buffer where we're reading in the data. Again, in this session, we're not talking about how the data comes in. We're just assuming the data is already there. The first thing we're going to do is copy that raw barcode data into a new set of registers where we can work on it without impacting the original data as it's received. Here I'm moving that into register 101 through 116 because we're talking about data that's bigger than one word or two words long we're going to use a multi-shift to move the data where we want it. Remember, in this example, the part number data we're trying to isolate is in the 12th character location. I've created a byte style multi-shift, which starts at register 101, where we've got our working location for the data we're dealing with. It's 32 bytes long, or 16 words. We're shifting 11 bytes so that we have the 12th byte in the first position where we can see it. For the direction, we're shifting right. We need an always off here in this field, and then the data we're going to be shifting in every time is in register 121, which is named null character. That's just a register that always has a value of zero. Then the output of our shift register is just a junk variable that we don't care about, but we do have to assign, and I've assigned that to register 122. Now I'll quickly show what this all looks like when I go into the multi-shift. Once that's done, just like in the example in the slides, we don't have the data completely isolated. We just have it in the first position, which is register 101, where it's more convenient to work on it. Now we're going to do a block move operation. This is a byte type block move where we have one character per byte. We've got a nine character part number that we want. So we're going to move nine characters or nine bytes from R101, which is being shifted to a new variable called part number 
which has been assigned to register 141 through 145. That's because for nine characters, that's going to take up five words. So that's from register 141 through 145. Once we've done that, the only thing left to deal with is the 10th character or that 10th field in those five registers. We're going to write that as a zero. For this, we're going to do another byte move, but we're moving a constant value of zero. Here, we need to move it into the upper byte of the fifth register that's storing that part number. So the part number starts at R141. The nine characters of the part number that we want are stored in the first nine fields in R141 through 145, up to the least significant byte of register 145. For the most significant byte of register 145, we don't know what that value is, so we want to set it to zero. This zero value, which is ASCII null, is the terminator value which sets the end of the ASCII field. That's the parsing we needed to do complete. So now let's see what this looks like on the OCS. Here is the ASCII example. At the top you'll see the raw barcode data. It starts with the serial number field SN1011. That's followed by a box, which is a carriage return character. It can't be drawn another way, so it's just represented by a box. After that is a four digit numeric field, 1234, and then the part number starts. In the second field, we're showing the data after we shifted it. Here, our part number is now at the beginning, but we still have a carriage return and some other data at the end that we want to get rid of. Then we did our byte move function that moves the first nine characters over to a new variable and then sets a zero at the tenth character, which is a terminator, telling the OCS that the ASCII field is complete. Thank you for joining us for today's tutorial, and the Q&A session will begin shortly. Okay, we'll have a quick look at the questions panel. Um, how did you determine the decimal value for the AND block? Um, so for that, depending on the bits you need to be zeroed, you can just write the value in, say, even the calculator app on your PC in binary, and then just choose the decimal option then, and you'll have the decimal value required. Uh, not seeing anything else just now. Okay, I shall go to the screen as we always do. Which, <clears throat> excuse me, hopefully you can all see now. Um, if you can't, you can just drop it in the questions panel. Um, so that's today's webinar. We do not have a webinar next week, as we have noted down here, as it is St. Patrick's Day, a national holiday, or Paddy's Day, as we like to call it. Uh, but the week after, we do have we are returning with analog filtering techniques into custom fonts the week after, and then using WebMI. Uh, the registration forms are all there for those. So if you do have an interest in sitting in on any of those, you can register now and you'll get an email the day before reminding you about the webinar. But as always, the, the webinar will be at the same time on a Thursday every week, bar next week, as I have said. And again, like an old broken record here, but if there is any any past webinars we have done that you missed or want to call back on for certain information, we keep them all on, on this section of the website as well, so you can go back to those at any time. Uh, and at that, it doesn't look like there's any question, any more questions. Thank you for joining us again this morning, and we hope to see you when we're back again in two weeks. Have a good day.